Little Rock Nine were a group of nine high school students who integrated Central High School in Little Rock, Arkansas in 1957. They became the first black students to attend an all-white high school in Arkansas and to communicate to the primarily white discriminating crowd who wanted to keep their school segregated. The Little Rock Nine showed that they loved their education and that they would risk their lives to obtain it. They faced inequality and injustice, but they persevered through it all and changed the history of education for black students all over the world. Ernest Green. Thelma Mothershed, Carlotta Walls Lanier, Elizabeth Eckford, Jefferson Thomas, Gloria Karlmark, Terrence Roberts, Minna Jean Brown Trickney, and Mella Beal. Those were all members of the Little Rock Nine. And the Little Rock Nine are all important. But today, I would like to talk to you about just one of them. <laughs> Dr. Melo Patillo Beals was born on December 7th, 1941, the same day that Japan bombed Pearl Harbor, Hawaii. Growing up in Arkansas, Dr. Beals was often curious about racism and why blacks were treated so poorly. When Dr. Beals was just 15, she received a chance to attend Central High School in Little Rock, Arkansas. Central High was bigger than any of the black schools and was high in the ranks of education. Dr. Beale signed the paperwork, enabling her to go into Central High School, but little did she know how bad everything was going to be. White high schoolers that attended Central High threw eggs and food at the Little Rock Nine when they passed them in the hallway and while they were in class. They, tr they created hateful rhymes and messages that they sang out while they were passing Dr. Beals in the hallway. She attended Central High School for a year, enduring the hateful classmates and the whites around her as they kicked her and they threw acid into her eyes. But Dr. Mel Beals had the help of someone far superior than the whites around her. Grandmother repeatedly said to me, though, wherever you go, God goes with you. Mm -hmm. Touch your right cheek. God is as close as your skin. Yeah. And so he is enjoying this first day of school with you, mm -hmm. and he will instruct you how to respond. Dr. Beals' grandmother was very important to her because she helped her get through tough times as a kid. One of her grandmother's favorite songs was, I'm on the battlefield for my Lord. This song was sung because of the cruelty the Blacks had to go through at that time because of racism. At the end of the school year, Governor Favis closed all of Arkansas schools to prevent integration. After being harassed for a couple of months out of school, Dr. Beals relocated to California because it was deemed unsafe for her to stay in that environment. She stayed with a white family until going to college in which she received a Bachelor of Arts degree and a Master's degree in journalism from San Francisco State University and Columbia University Graduate School of Journalism in New York. Even through great opposition, Dr. Beals went on to receive two doctorate degrees as well. Since then, Dr. Beale has written five books and received the Robert F. Kennedy Book Award. Four of the five books that she has written include March Forward Girl, White in a State of Mind, I Will Not Fear, and Warriors Don't Cry. Dr. Mebo Beals has three children and currently lives in Marin, Sonoma County and is even present today. She attended St. Andrew Church and now joins us virtually. Dr. Mebo Beals, we love you and we appreciate all that you have done and all that you are doing. And I'm so grateful for the opportunity to have such a legend in my church community and to see the world impacted by you, even now. Joelle did an incredible job 
talking about you as not only a, 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 for, a forerunner, but also as a person who also is a forerunner of faith and history. And we thank you for all that you've done. And we wanna give you a chance to speak to us in this moment about what should we be doing now? Well, one of the things you have to have, in my case, I'm 79. And when I was uh, six, first 15, uh, I was born December 7th, 1941. So when I was first 15 going to Central High School, let me say to you that um, I had no idea that I would be on a walker or in a wheelchair marching with uh, Black Lives Matter. I thought that as a child, 16 and 15, I would go to Central High School <clears throat> and that would be that. They would see that I was God's child, that I was bright. I had a long ponytail. My saddle shoes were polished. <coughs> I had a little cough um, and I went to church and I thought, okay, cool. But it wasn't like that at all. So what I wanna say to you is, um, I have on my Instagram, John Lewis standing behind me and he's got his hands on my shoulders. And before, <coughs> I don't have anything. I just put something down my throat on. Before he died, he's, we saw each other at an event about a year before he died and he said, Melba, what are you doing in the wheelchair? And I said, well, brother, I had four spine surgeries. And he said, you better get your butt up out of that chair. He says, we ain't got no time for that chair. There is no time for resting. Get your butt busy, right? There's no time. What the hell's wrong with you? And he just told me off. So what I have to say to all of you is there is no time for resting. Biden is in. He's most, one of the most wonderful human beings on the planet. I didn't want him to become president in the beginning because he's too sweet to become president. And then the Lord Jesus said, I'm gonna help you with this. I'm gonna send your buddy Kamala. Well, let me say this about that. I don't know any 10 men with the strength of Kamala. And so we're good. He's backed up by the right lady. Only a black woman could handle that spot. A woman of Indian and black descent has everything she needs. And so uh, we are blessed at this moment, but let's not get comfortable. I, I sometimes give this speech around the country and it's called, who let the dogs out? We did. How did Trump become president? We let him. We were busy wearing our Jimmy Choo's and celebrating and being black folks who had arrived. And we looked the other way for five minutes and Mr. Trump got in. And so now, <clears throat> what did I do during the last election? I tried to write at least 100 letters a day. I didn't always do it, but I, but I set that goal. I worked uh, with people out of Georgia. I worked with various groups around the country. I tried to speak as much as I could on uh, Zoom, which I did accomplish that. But we have to stay busy. Uh, it has been a very long journey for all of us. But uh, as Martin Luther King said to me, when I was a child, I was complaining. Martin Luther King would come over to see us, uh, to tell us to, you know, and his first visit that he came, I did, I'd never met him before and I didn't know who he was. And he stepped into the room and as everybody said, the room just went silent. There was like, uh, when he comes into a room, there's silence and there's like, you know, even as a 16 year old child, when I first met him, I knew that he was uh, someone unlike my parents, someone unlike my minister. I knew that he was someone different. So he stepped into this room and he said, um, you know, what's up? And I knew to keep my big mouth shut. But first I said to him that I was sad and I was limping and everything. And he said, you know what? You're not doing this for yourself, Melba. You're doing this for generations yet unborn. And so we're, we have to keep working for those unborn as he did. Uh, remember his, I have a dream speech. He said, um, I will not go to the top of the mountain with you. Basically he says, he says, I've seen the top of the mountain. 
you will see it, but I, I will not be with you on the other side. So he knew what was gonna happen if he continued doing what he was doing. He told us to begin with, yeah, you, you might die. That's cool. I mean, you might, but that can't be your goal. Your goal has to be what you're going to accomplish uh, and what you will do for generations yet unborn. And so it is important for us at this point to not be engaged in how things have been in 2020. Who could have guessed that it would be that awful? But I have to tell myself every day, get up. Uh, what are you going, what, what are your 10 things that you're grateful for today? And we are, we have lots to be grateful for each other. We have just finished an incredible period of time where it looks like we could see the light at the end of the tunnel. So my words are, it's just a long journey. There is no graduation. I remember telling my grandmother one time, I said, <clears throat> when's the graduation? And she said, what are you talking about? Because she would always tell me two things. You are a warrior on the battlefield for your Lord, which is by the way, a hymn that black folks sang when I was a child. And then another one was March 4th. She would always just say to me, I've named my latest book, March 4th. You got to March 4th. I don't want to hear your complaints. There is no reason to complain. There's only reason to show me a list of what you're going to do. God is as close to you as your skin. Touch your sheep. God's right there. No problem. If you have a real problem, and if you ever need him, he will be there. And I have to say to you that in my lifetime, I have learned that to be true. I have lived a different life than most people I meet. I have been in a riot like you saw February 6th or January 6th. I've been there, been there, done that. I went to Central High School when there were thousands of people gathering outside, rioting every day. I have been standing in line waiting my turn to be hanged before. I've seen black folks, our folks hanging from a line, a baby. The thing that tore me up most was uh, my two-year-old neighbor hanging from a, a, a clothesline post in, my ba in the backyard next to me, okay? Uh, I've been there, done that. I watched them hang a man from my roof of my church as a child, five years of age. Been there, done that. And so what I do know is that when I've needed God, when I thought I was really gonna hit it, particularly the time I was kidnapped, I thought, okay, that's it. And, and I would do it exactly what grandmother said. She would say, touch your cheek. Now, God is there. Never, 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 never has he failed me, including uh, the time I was in intensive care with my spine surgery gone wrong. Somebody did something they shouldn't have done. I always did exactly what she said. And I must say to you that God is there for each of you. I'm nothing special. God just is with us. He walks beside us. He holds our hand and he is willing to help us achieve what we want to achieve. But each day we have to stay aware of the fact. We have to remain aware of the fact that there is something expected of us because we are here and now. And we have to be the ones who lay the path for our kids. We are the ones that have to do what is good for the future. So it ain't easy, I gotta tell you, once again, I never thought I would be 79, talking about this, thinking about this, doing this, wondering about this. My neighbor moved out of my neighborhood three uh, three days ago. You know what she said? This is a neighbor who's never spoken to me. I've lived here for a year and a half. She said, I'm moving because niggas have moved in my neighborhood. I'm moving because you are here. Now the woman cat corner across the street came over a few days after I moved in and said, listen, why are there white people visiting you? Right? They were, they were like, when I came here from Arkansas, I was adopted by a white family. So every Christmas, 30 white people show up at my house, right? Their parents, the McCabe's, raised me from 16 forward. So that's my, that's my other family, right? So they came in for their Christmas dinner. The woman across the street said, who are you and who are all these people? And does that mean you're going to jail? On and on and on she went. She's never been back. So at least you think we've arrived anywhere. I'm here to tell you that why don't you go house hunting with me or job hunting with me or uh, any of the places that I fly or go sometimes, which are quite unwelcoming. And so we have to just stay with the program. Um, I hope there was a way out. I hope that we would all find 
total relief. I used to say, Grandma, it's going to be perfect. When I get to be a grown person, we're going to just have everything, be everything, and do everything. And she used to say, well, thank God that he's going to walk beside you because you do not get it yet, that it's not quite going to be that way. And so it's not that way, but it can be better for our children. So that's what I would have to say to you this morning is that what grandmother would tell you if she were here would be to march forward, y'all. We have no choice but to march forward. We have no choice but to remain aware. We have no choice but to continue this battle. We celebrate Black History Month because we don't want to do that again. I very personally don't want to go to Central High School again. That would be nine months of absolute living hell. I do not want to need troops again. If you got to have the 101st Airborne escort you to school, you're in a lot of trouble, okay? And so I don't want that again. But if it comes, I'm willing to face it because inevitably I would say to you, march forward. So that's what I have to, that, that would be my brief and un, <laughs> uninitiated uh, surprise message today is just march forward and be grateful that we have so much more privilege. My grandmother walked every day to work, five miles, worked in White Lady's Kitchens as a maid and came home every evening through the snow and, and after cleaning all day, 12 hours, cooked dinner, et cetera, she'd go to work at four in the morning. But she did that so that my mother could get her master's and her doctorate degree, walked 10 miles a day to Philanna Smith College and got herself, what, her doctorate degree and taught. And my mother struggled, so I would come up. My mother wouldn't die. She honestly was in a coma for nine years and they kept calling me a little rock saying, your mother's dying today. She looked at me like I was crazy. And then she said, show me your degree. When she could come, come to light, she would speak French fluid French because she taught, she spoke six languages and she would say one thing, show me your degree. And when I showed her my doctorate, when I showed her, it's okay, she died. And so what I say to you is show me what you got, pack it. Uh, <clears throat> if you are gonna make it for you and the children that will come behind us, show me what you got and keep marching, okay? So for Christ's sake, amen. Thank you, oh Lord Jesus, for letting us be here and for letting us be together as a family and for letting us hear the love and the joy from each other and give us the strength to do as you have instructed, which is to march forward. So thank you. Amen. Put your hands together. Give a whoop and a wild praise wherever you are. <laughs> Keep your heart, your hands. We, are, we celebrate you. We have one phone to pick with you. You <laughs> said you were nothing special. Clearly, you are someone very special. And we thank you for sharing it with us. God bless. And it's thank you here. for being here. <laughs> Hallelujah. Let's move on with as we continue to worship the Lord in spirit and in truth with the call confession, Stephanie James Ellis. <laughs> 